from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Earlier in this calendar year, here in the Northwest, in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, we had a, a natural disaster. We had from great uh, rains and melting of snow floods that uh, disrupted the lives of many of our people in the Northwest. And we have decided to invite to the program two guests that can address this question and how government at the national, state, and local level cooperate together to assist those who had gone through this very unfortunate experience. The title of the program today is really the work of the Federal Emergency Management Agency in time of disasters and their cooperation with other agencies. I'm pleased to welcome to the program two guests. Uh, one is from the state of Idaho. Uh, he is from the Bureau of Disaster Services for the state of Idaho, and his, back, uh, his title is actually Earthquake Program Coordinator. I welcome to the program Stephen Weiser. Mr. Weiser, it's a pleasure to have you on our pleasure program. To be here. Thank you for yes. coming today. And our second guest is Doug Gore, who is the Federal Program Coordinator or, uh, from um, the uh, FEMA, and I believe you're headquartered in uh, Denver, Colorado. And uh, Mr. Gore, it's a pleasure to have you in our state, and thank you for the help that you've brought uh, to the people of Idaho. Thank you. <coughs> and as always, I'm very pleased to have our regular panelist, uh, uh, Steve Schink, who is the Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College, and to inquire about what FEMA does and other agencies, we'll ask Steve to commence the questioning. Thank you, Tony. I wonder if we could begin with kind of a, 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 an agency overview, if I could call it that, and when, what I would invite you each to do is, is to describe your agencies and tell us a little bit about how they're organized and the kinds of services they provide. And Steve, maybe we ought to go from a state level and, and move to Doug then, who can tell us a little bit about uh, national disaster relief. Sure. Uh, the Idaho Bureau of Disaster Services is, uh, is uh, charged with uh, coordinating emergency management in the state. That involves training uh, of local emergency managers in each county and uh, exercising them and assisting them in, in preparing emergency response plans. Uh, when it, that's day-to-day -day work. When, uh, when an emergency occurs, why then uh, we take on a, a, an additional role of coordinating the needs of the local community and uh, trying to match those up with state resources. When those uh, uh, when we're unable to uh, supply those, then we turn to the federal government for assistance. And that comes through uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And, and FEMA's role is really to be a coordinator um, of all federal resources when there is a disaster. Uh, FEMA was actually created in 1979 to be a single point of contact uh, for state governments in particular so that we could assist with the preparedness efforts, the training efforts, uh, mitigation, which is a, a new program that's um, very important to, to FEMA to reduce or eliminate the, the threats that present themselves, as well as our response pr programs and capabilities. And so we do work um, hand in hand with the states and, and coordinate with the, our federal counterpart agencies as well to deliver um, an integrated package, if you will, of uh, federal disaster assistance. And uh, not one more quick uh, 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 sort of an organizational question to both of you. Could, can you tell me, uh, as you move up the hierarchy of state and federal governments, who you're organized under, what, what agencies or departments you report to? The uh, Bureau of Disaster Services is uh, under the military division for the state, oh. which is uh, directly under the governor. So uh, uh, the adjutant general of the, sta uh, the state of Idaho is uh, the uh, titular head of, of our organization. And in times of disaster, why he does uh, speak for the governor and assist in, in that coordination function. And FEMA is an independent agency. It, it does not have uh, department status, though recently our director, James Lee Witt, has been given uh, cabinet level status. He's invited to all the cabinet meetings, and, and he does uh, report directly to the president. I would like to uh, zero in on a little bit more detail, uh, as Steve has, has done. I was talking with one of the other gentlemen who is with you today before we started the program, and he was indicating, uh, if I can start with FEMA here, that there's about 26 agencies that can become involved. Um, a lot of them are federal agencies, depending on the magnitude of the disaster. I know that you received a really positive reaction from the American people uh, with the terrible floods that took place in the Midwest a couple of years ago. Could you kind of walk us through 
uh, even though this certainly was a disaster here in the Northwest, that when it reaches a certain level that it's more than FEMA can handle or, or the state agencies, uh, walk us through kind of an organizational chart of who else can be called in to assist to try to bring things back to normalcy as much as possible. I know that with some destruction you can never replace certain things, but uh, to, to get the people back on their feet. Okay, i pleased to do that. We um, are trying to be very responsive, of course, to state governments, and real emergency management really occurs at the local level. The daily uh, fire departments, police departments are actively involved in, in life-saving efforts and, and those actions that will protect life and property. Um, when it gets an event is beyond their capability, if it's a city or a town, they, they'll go to the county. Uh, the county is in the same situation. They have departments and agencies that support their efforts. When it gets beyond their capability, they will go to the state. If it's beyond state capability, the state um, will request FEMA assistance. FEMA gets involved when the, by invitation of the governor. The governor actually will request the president to declare a, a major disaster, as has occurred in Washington and Oregon and Idaho most recently. And at that point, it, it starts a number of things. Uh, one thing, it activates what we call the uh, federal response plan, uh, whereby this, these 26 agencies that you mentioned, uh, they become um, basically at our assistance and to, us, uh, to help us uh, respond to the needs of the state and, and in turn the local governments. So when FEMA makes a request, you are somewhat free to ask which other agencies that you want to That help. is correct. Uh, it is a fully uh, coordinated plan. Uh, the agencies know that, we're, that they're going to be called. We have training with the agencies. Uh, our 10 regional offices are involved in um, co uh, regional committees that uh, have made up of federal agencies that know each other and will be involved in, in time of a disaster. Uh, FEMA, like uh, state and local governments, has a, a, an emergency management plan, if you will. It's real important to prepare for disasters and know who's going to do what and who the players are uh, who are going to respond. And at the federal level, we have what's called a federal response plan. And this plan identifies uh, 12 functions. Uh, we call them emergency support functions. And so if we have any disaster assignment, we will as make assignments to one of those emergency support functions. For example, emergency support function one is uh, transportation. It's headed by the U.S. Department of Transportation. And so we, if we have a mission for, uh, regarding transportation, we will ask the U.S. Department of Transportation. They're in the best situation to do that. And then the other, every other ESF is also, or emergency support function, is headed by a different federal agency. The only exception is the Red Cross, who is uh, over our mass, mass care, and they're the ones that will set up the shelters and um, mass feeding and so forth to help in a disaster. In addition to transportation, what other agencies do come Well, along? we have uh, the National Communication System, uh, helps us with communications. The Corps of Engineers helps us with public works. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency helps us with uh, hazardous materials. The uh, Department of Energy helps us with energy issues. And uh, I mentioned the Red Cross. They, they help us with um, food. We also have the Food uh, Nutrition Service. Department of Agriculture helps us with actual <coughs> food supplies. And they're able, actually able to divert uh, foodstuffs from the, the school lunch program to disaster areas. And so they use their existing resources, and that's something I think is very important to understand is that when there's a disaster, we do not have a duplicate system that goes into effect. We use the resources of um, federal, state, and local governments that exist by the people that uh, normally run those functions on a day-to-day -day basis. And so they're in the best position to, to run those functions when there's a disaster. When governors ask for disaster relief and the president agrees, the president uh, usually visits the area. I know President Clinton came to Oregon and to Washington, Idaho, and he met with the governors, and, and I know Steve could uh, verify this from Idaho. When Governor Phil Batt met with President Bill Clinton, uh, they both moved into action immediately, and the governor's comments in the state was that he was so impressed how quick the action took place and that relief was almost immediate. Uh, this is a reputation that FEMA has gotten in, in the most recent years, and again in the Midwest and here. Uh, has there been any change that it causes? FEMA moves faster than it ever has before, along in its cooperation. States do too. Uh, I know you have a plan, but uh, mm -hmm. could you just explain why th that you can make all of those moves, which involves a lot of personnel and, and resources, so quickly? Well, one thing we um, begin to start moving now before the disaster is actually declared by the president. In other words, I was. Um, in Colorado and uh, Denver. I had anticipated going to New Jersey to, to work on a disaster uh, when the call came that I might be going to Idaho instead. And so that um, the floods had started um, in early February. Uh, by 
Thursday and Friday that week, I had received word, and so we started to assemble our team in Denver. We have a, what we call a regional operations center, and fortunately we were able to bring people back from uh, working on the floods and the snowstorms uh, in, on the East Coast, and we were able to assemble our staff. And so by uh, Sunday, when the disaster was uh, actually declared Sunday evening, uh, we had actually people pre-positioned in Idaho. Um, and we were able to, on Monday, I, I flew out, met with the state, and the state is our single point of contact, so it was important for us to meet with them first. We also do a number of things. Um, public information is very important. Uh, we used to establish centers where people used to register for assistance. Well, now people register for assistance through a te uh, teleregistration center that's located in Denton, Texas. There's one toll-free number that they call, and they can register. And as soon as they register, we can arrange then for an inspector to visit their home. Rather than use uh, FEMA inspectors, we now use contractors to help us out. So technology, I think the use of <coughs> private, uh, the private sector to help us. And these contractors will, these inspectors will visit the homes of individuals. Uh, within four days, uh, many times when people register. And then by, that was um, on Thursday when the inspectors went out, and by Friday we had written our first check from a, a central place in, um, again, in Denton, Texas, where we were able to uh, issue checks for, to help people with housing and for rental assistance or to do minor repairs so they can get back into their homes. And I imagine there's another process here, and Steve could answer this question. I know Governor Batt was so concerned, and he came to North Idaho several trips yes, and, and toured immediately. <coughs> And Senator Mary Lou Reed, I know that her district was affected, and she was touring. Uh, people such as Governor Bad and Senator Reed, they, I assume, then feed back information and, uh, and work closely with you. I mean, everyone becomes a team automatically. Uh. That's true. That's true. And, and in fact, uh, when, when the floods were uh, imminent, uh, we were getting weather reports and uh, reports from the uh, county coordinators uh, so that we, again, had an idea that something was coming. We talked to FEMA. Uh, and uh, we were preparing also for the potential of, of a presidential disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, when Governor Batt made his first trip uh, on, the, on the 10th, why, uh, we had a declaration drafted mm -hmm. and we heard in the helicopter, he said, uh, have it ready when I get back. So uh, uh, that worked very quickly. And then, of course, uh, the following Monday, we had FEMA there and it was uh, very gratifying. Thank you. Steve we're, we're, we're a very small agency and uh, it it is completely beyond our capacity to respond mm -hmm. uh, to a disaster like this. So it's essential that we have that cooperation from, from, the, from the federal level. And, and I might mention, too, that it's um, important to realize <coughs> we try to be very responsive to what the state says and what they request. And so probably more than anything else, um, listening to what the state is actually asking us to do and then finding the resources to meet that need is something very important. We, we also work closely with the media. Uh, we get in contact with television, radio, newspapers. Uh, we also have a community relations program whereby we have uh, liaisons that are established working in the community to inform local officials what's happening. And we also work with congressional offices. So a lot of those things happened very early on. Uh, they were happening uh, on the weekend before the de de uh, declaration, and it was happening immediately when we came to, came to Idaho. And so that really made a big difference, being responsive to what the issues are. Steve Sheen. In my, uh, in my first line of question, uh, when we talked a little bit about your role in mission, I, n I noticed that you both talked about education, and, and I'm, I'm guessing there that, that a big part of that is, is directed at agencies that provide disaster relief and building the kind of plan, uh, Doug, that you talked about. But, but I'd like to focus a little bit on, on individuals, and I wonder if you could both share with us uh, from your background some information that might be helpful to our audience wherever they are. Uh, uh, about some things that they should be aware of uh, uh, in terms of choices that they make and where to buy and where to build and where to live. Also about the kinds of uh, protections that are available to them either through state, uh, local, or federal governments or, or private carriers in terms of insurance. Um, wh whoever would like <coughs> to start first. Well, uh, I think the most important thing to realize and recognize is that we live in a dangerous world. We tend to be complacent. Uh, so we're surprised when bad things happen. Uh, the most important part of the educational program is to recognize that fact uh, and recognize that uh, when bad things happen, there are things you as an in individual can do. Uh, then once, once you recognize that, then, then there are things uh, you can do as a society uh, and then go from there. Now, uh, your multi-part question was, uh, 
Well, mm -hmm. uh, got me two, a little. Uh, two parts again, and I, just to briefly summarize, <clears throat> uh, what kind of, of warnings would you provide to people about their choices of where to live, and and then. Uh, if they are living in a high-risk area, what kind of insurance is available to them, either from the government or from the private sector, to help mitigate some of those risks? Once again, uh, those many of those decisions happen at the local level. Uh, county commissions, uh, may, uh, city, uh, uh, put together uh, planning and zoning, uh, land use plans, which try to guide us in, in places for uh, for uh, for our residences and for our commercial structures. Uh, that does hap have to happen at the local level, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, we uh, we don't we don't enforce that at the state level. So w once once you've made a decision to move into an area, then then you uh, then you accept the risk there. Uh, one of the risks in this case is flooding. So and what, you, what you're saying there, for the most part, is that the, the government doesn't tell you no, you can't live here. Um, in, in most cases, those are just choices we make as individuals. Except with this one specific case, which is the uh, National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, and, and I can talk to that sure. if you'd like. It, it, mm -hmm. it is a, a program uh, that's uh, administered by FEMA. It was established in 1968. And part of its goal was to identify flood hazard uh, areas throughout the United States. Uh, recognize that disasters were costly mm -hmm. um, and that insurance would be a good alternative to disaster assistance. Many of our programs, um, we provide a housing program, which is a housing grant to people that, that have problems, but the actual repair and long-term recovery is usually handled by loans that people are able to get through the Small Business Administration. And so insurance, a loan you have to pay back, and insurance is, uh, again, it's uh, something that's there when you need it. Um, and it's something that people should uh, carry, particularly if you live in a flood hazard area. Uh, people that live in a flood hazard area, which is defined as the 100-year floodplain, that can get uh, confusing because it's uh, not the flood that only happens once every 100 years. It's a flood that has a 1% chance of occurring, of uh, being equaled or exceeded in any given year. And over the life of a 30-year mortgage, someone that lives in a 100-year floodplain has a one chance in four of being flooded. So that's a fairly significant uh, risk, if you will, to living in the floodplain. Flood insurance is also available outside of the floodplain uh, for, a, for a reduced rate. But we would certainly encourage people to purchase flood insurance uh, if they live in a flood hazard area and be aware of uh, the things that they can do. They, they can also do things that will protect their home, and that's one thing that, that mitigation is all about. Uh, Steve mentioned the codes that <coughs> the local governments can adopt building standards. In fact, to be eligible for flood insurance, you need to have a floodplain management ordinance enforced in the community that establishes the level to which the lowest floor of new buildings should be built. And so in return for that commitment by local government, flood insurance is made available on all the buildings in the community. And so people can purchase flood insurance. They can elevate their homes above flood levels. Uh, they can do smaller things, too, like raise their furnace, or their hot water heaters, their washers, their dryers, things that they might have in their lower levels of their homes. We're, uh, we're kind of focused here naturally on, on flood insurance because that's been Idaho's most recent experience and also uh, the Oregon uh, coastal areas. But uh, we've got viewers in, in parts of the country where flood may not be their biggest mm -hmm. uh, concern. I is uh, protection against lightning, uh, uh, hurricane, wind damage, uh, uh, tornadoes. Are those, the, are those kinds of coverage that are normally available just through a commercial insurance carrier? Well, your homeowner's policy does fortunately cover you for wind. But as... Um, we saw in the case, and sometimes a hurricane, for example, can be wind and water. And so depending on the type of hurricane that it is and the type of um, damage that's uh, associated with that, uh, we'll determine whether a homeowner's policy or a flood insurance policy will cover it. So you're okay with tornadoes and the wind for a hurricane, but the flood, you need a separate flood insurance policy. Um, Steve could probably talk best about the earthquake uh, hazard in the state of yeah, the Idaho northwest region northwest. Is, a, is a seismically active area. That's a that's a hazard I neglected to mention. What about earthquakes? Well, we uh, we enjoy our mountains, and mountains uh, <coughs> are uh, are the visual uh, result of earthquakes, uh, moving earth. So uh, it should be testament to every time we look out the window that we live in earthquake country. Uh, the problem tends to be that uh, they happen infrequently for us uh, in geologic time. They happen quite often, but. Uh, it's easy to forget things that, that we don't that we don't think about much. Most of the earthquakes that we have in Idaho are uh, in the uh, wilderness regions, so it's the case of the tree falling uh, with no one to hear it. Uh, does it really happen? Well, the earthquakes do happen. We can measure them, and they point to continuing seismic activity. Now, the earthquake itself is uh, 
uh, may occur some distance away, but the shaking has an effect uh, over a large area. And that's what we're, we're really concerned with. If you, uh, if you have modern building codes uh, and enforce them, why then uh, uh, we should be pretty well protected against the kinds of uh, shaking we expect in, in, in areas like this. You that, that sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was going to mention, you <coughs> mentioned hail, which is an interesting one. Uh, Denver had a hailstorm that caused $400 million worth of damage, but it was covered by homeowners insurance. And there is a move around the country um, nationally to come up with a uh, national um, insurance, if you will, all hazards insurance, because different areas, every area of the country has a hazard. But uh, public policy, the thought is, well, maybe there ought to be an all hazards insurance um, in addition to flood insurance to help us out when that happens. So it'll be interesting to see where that, where that idea goes. Because uh, earthquakes are also not covered by your homeowner's policy, so you need a separate, uh, separate policy for that. And but there you, are but, some you, but a lot of insurance companies will cover you if you ask for it. It's more expensive, but you can get earthquakes. It's a separate policy. Yes. It isn't necessarily a rider on your homeowner's insurance. Right. I noticed during <coughs> this uh, disaster here that uh, you know, some areas were much more low level than others, and the, and the flooding did more damage. And I wish you to explain to our viewers that I know the, on the insurance you're talking about that there are certain penalties that can be applied if, if local government does not have certain standards. Would you take us through that? In other words, uh, there, there are certain things that local government can do that is helpful to the, the citizenry to, for the future to make sure that they're covered with like flood insurance. Uh, I'd be pleased to. We, um, I mentioned earlier that flood insurance, uh, in order to have flood insurance sold in your community, a condition for that ins insurance is that the local governments adopt a floodplain management ordinance. Now that ordinance um, is used as the basis for uh, establishing the level to which the lowest floor of each um, new home or new business should be built. There's nothing required of the old construction unless it is damaged more than 50 percent in a flood or other, other type of um, disaster. And so we have a, a case where local governments, if they enforce their ordinances, will, will continue to be eligible for the sale of flood insurance. Uh, we assist communities. We visit communities. We try to help them uh, improve their local programs and their building standards. And there are communities that actually exceed the minimum standards of the flood insurance program. And we encourage that, particularly in areas that might have a unique hazard, flash flood hazard, uh, high, heavy debris loads in their streams, those kinds of things. They, they would need to look at a higher standard than the minimum standard. In fact, we reward communities that are individuals that, uh, and communities that do that. Uh, communities that do more than our minimum standards get a break on their insurance. They, we have a, what's called a community rating system, whereby, just like fire rating systems, the better your fire departments, the lower your fire rates, the better your floodplain management programs, the lower your insurance rates will be. And of course, the individual can always say, well, I don't want to just build at a 100-year level. I want to build a foot higher than that or two feet higher. And they'll rece receive a break on their insurance if they take those extra steps. So their the rates depending on all those conditions. Right, that's correct. <coughs> for all communities. Um, something else, that too, that uh, I think we should get across the viewers because we hear about uh, the help and the assistance, which is very encouraging. But if you take the total dollars that a earthquake does or a flood or a hurricane, whatever it is, even with all the cooperation from all the government entities, the amount of money that comes in cannot cover the entire cost. In other words, homeowners and business and so forth are still out uh, uh, some expense for this whole process, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Or is, is there some kind of percentage that you kind of give us about how much uh, relief that the, the government funds will provide and how much is still left for the citizen? Well, again, the, the assistance from FEMA is meant to be supplemental uh, to what the state and local governments provide. Uh, our program, for example, for repairing roads and bridges, uh, these are county roads and bridges, uh, is 75-25 percent match. And that 25... 75 from federal. 75-25 and 25 non-federal. It, it can be a combination of state and local governments. And so we are involved with, with assisting communities in that regard. Uh, federal aid system roads, which are your major uh, interstates and your state uh, highways and so forth, uh, those systems are eligible for funding at 100 percent federal funding. And so those, most of the community's infrastructure can be repaired uh, but it's on that, that, that match basis. Uh, individuals and businesses, um, it's very difficult sometimes because people will, can have an existing mortgage uh, if they don't have flood insurance, assume their house is swept away. They can get a loan, but they still have that existing mortgage in place in addition to paying back a loan. So that can be very difficult for people. And that's why we want to stress mitigation. You mentioned the cost of disasters. If we could find a way to actually reduce the damages that would occur from a disaster, we'd all be a lot better off. 
Um, nationally, we, we're uh, facing strains with our budgets, and we've had disasters that are bigger than ever before. And so we need to reduce those costs, and we can't fund all the, the losses that occur, but we even need to reduce those losses further through mitigation. Well, now you mentioned something that I found very interesting just a second ago, that we've had nationally disasters that are bigger than ever before. Um, and I've been in Idaho now almost 12 years, and I don't recall flooding at this level before. Maybe, I, maybe I've conveniently forgotten it, but I don't think so. What, do, do you keep statistics, your two agencies? And, and, uh, and are we in a period of uh, where, for whatever reason, uh, natural disasters seem to be coming more frequently or are more severe? Uh, we certainly are uh, nationally as far as the dollar cost of disasters. Uh, Hurricane Andrew uh, was the biggest disaster we'd ever had, and then the prior one was the, hurricane, the Hugo hurricane. And then we had the Northridge earthquake, and we had the Midwest floods and then the Northwest, uh, North Ridge earthquake. And each one, it seems like every major disaster we were having was bigger than the last one. Uh, some of those have to do with um, where we're building. We have more people. Uh, in the past, uh, the Mississippi River has certainly flooded, uh, but there weren't people living there uh, when it had this, that particular type of flood event in the past. And so as we um, increase our urbanization and development, we're going to have uh, more hazards and our disasters uh, may continue to increase in size. In, in Idaho, Steve, is that your perception as well? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the desirable places to build are, are, are in floodplains in our valleys, uh, so they are at risk from water damage. Uh, uh, they become at greater risk as we urbanize from, from any kind of natural disaster because our, uh, our, uh, our urbanized uh, lifelines, uh, emergency care, and uh, the conveniences of life can become more easily dis disrupted. And I, I know we are running out of time, but, uh, but a quick question that's, that, that <coughs> Tony uh, 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 sparked some interest in, in me, in, uh, and that is whether or not businesses qualify for, for flood insurance, or is it? Yes, it, they do. It it's businesses and homeowners. Um, they qualify for insurance, and they also qualify for the Small Business Administration loans that I mentioned were available to the local officials. On that note, we'll have to bring the program to conclusion. On behalf of Steve Schink and our staff, we want to thank both of you gentlemen. You have been uh, very gracious with your time and you've been most informative and I again want to thank uh, Stephen uh, Weiser who is with the Idaho Bureau of Disaster Services and Doug Gore who is uh, with FEMA uh, and out of the Denver office and we thank you both for being here uh, and uh, you've been helpful to our viewers and uh, again we want to thank you for the relief that has come to the people of North Idaho and to other parts of the Northwest. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you have found this program informative and We'd like to invite you to be with us again next week at this very same time when we will discuss yet another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.